Welcome to the Knowledge Graph seminar. Today, we are in the week 10, the final week of the seminar. We've had a very interesting series uh, thus far. So this week, we are going to conclude the series. And today, we want to uh, present to you a survey of implementation tools for building knowledge graphs. This is a question we've had uh, quite often. Uh, people have appreciated the overview and the concepts and the theories that we've covered in the seminar until now, but then people want to know how should they get started on a project? What, what options do they have? What software implementation platforms are there? And Naren is gonna give us a very good overview of that. And after his portion, uh, I'm gonna take 10, 15 minutes to uh, summarize the series and uh, give you some key takeaways, uh, uh, especially along the theme of what's new about knowledge graphs. Because many times people say that, oh, you know, this is just old semantic networks rehashed. But there is definitely some new development, some innovation here, and I'd like to present to you my perspective on that. Okay, so uh, let's get started with the first part of the presentation. Uh, Naren, over to you. Thanks, Vinay. Let me share my screen. Cool, and there's a present button here. Okay. Looks good. Can you all see it? Okay, sounds yeah. good. The usual stuff, these are my own views, not related to my employer, I don't have any affiliation to any of these software, but I'm a fan of many of these. Just very impressed how amazing some of these open source projects are. Uh, so these are the rough topics I will be going through today. Um, I think architecting software is very different today. It's all about reuse of code rather than writing from scratch. And typic typically for knowledge graphs, since it's a highly processed structure data, Data, data structure, you have to go typically to, through these steps. You have to join a lot of data sources. Sometimes you have to join lists. Sometimes you have to join, um, you have to extract information from unstructured pieces like, net, uh, like news articles, et cetera. And after you do a lot of processing, you store it in graph databases for um, retrieval. And then there's another class of software or graph compute engines, which are great for doing large scale computations over graph. graph. So I will go through all of them. It'll be a whirlwind tour of um, all these categories. It'll sort of be breadth first search. I won't go into too much depth. Hopefully we can have a lot of questions during this session. And then we can spend a lot of time on answering those questions. So what is different about uh, architecting software today um, so a lot of, lot of things have changed. When I first graduated from college way back in 1997, it was all about how many lines of code I wrote, how, how are you writing these thousands of lines of code? That was a typical question in interviews. And now it's the reverse. How many packages have you reused? Um, how can you get efficient use of, how can you create software with efficient um, use of all that's available out there. And I think the overall strategy is to decompose a high level problem into uh, smaller components and then map each one, each component, subcomponent into some, uh, some, some software package that you can find from the open source world or some, or, or, or some or vendor or something like that. And then you write a lot of code to configure and glue all these pieces together. So I think you need um, maturity in mapping a subcomponent to a particular package. Then you need understanding to configure and glue them together. And due to uh, this is, I think, uh, a very good problem to have is there are too many, uh, too many options for uh, open source packages these days. And then it's a search ranking like problem then you need your own ranking function around, okay, is it a reputed source? How many stars, forks, all these kinds of metrics. And then you can make an informed decision about which packages to use. Cool. Uh, so first let's come to the first two topics like join, joining data and from lists and joining and e extracting information from unstructured sources. 
So, um, so let me look at my notes. Cool. So, um, typically, you to create knowledge graphs, you have to. This is a very common task you have to do all the time. And uh, when I covered this in one of the lectures, so I won't go into it uh, into too much depth. But typically, you need to join lists. Uh, here is an example where we want to create a more comprehensive view about Apple and companies in general. Um, and then what you do is you buy or you create lists from different sources and then you need to ma ma match those lists. And the problem is there's no nice key to join these lists. And then um, if you just look at Apple Inc and Apple Computers here, you can don't have in enough information to say that they are the same record, but when you include address, for example, you become more and more confident about um, about which records are actually talking about the same entity and which are not. So it's a very common task that you have to keep doing again and again. So um, what do you do? Um, you find a list of, you, you look at the open source community for uh, these record linkage software and there are lots of them available. And this is one of the most comprehensive that I found. Uh, it's a package called ddupe. Uh, it's a native Python package. And um, it gives you very, very good programmatic access. So first of all, you're de you to define all your column names by these data types. Um, there are these primitives like text, short text, date time, et cetera, but there are even more semantic kind of, semantic types, higher level, at uh, data types like price, address, and then they give you a lot of different options to match each of those in a fuzzy way. Uh, so that's a very, very comprehensive package. Uh, you can even define your own types. You can even uh, create your own um, matching, matching algorithms. Uh, they provide a lot of inbuilt ones. For example, if you, uh, if you define something as lat long, if there's a business and there's a lat long column, it will, it has a very nice metric on, I think it's called Haversine distance, which just doesn't cal calculate the Euclidean distance between the lat longs. It actually takes into account the curvature of the earth as if it was a, it was a sphere. Uh, there are lots of different um, good matching and parsing te techniques for addresses, names, et cetera. And I, if you remember, um, when I had taught, taught you about blocking, they have lots of uh, default blocking techniques. Uh, you can configure the blocking techniques. There are also two or three different kinds of uh, matching techniques. If, it, if you have examples of which pairs, which records belong together or not, it will actually, by default, be able to learn a logistic classifier. And then you can, of course, update it with other sklearn methods, but it has some inbuilt. Mm, when, if you use it by default, it just calculate cosine distance, and then you have to give it a thres threshold. And then based on, if you have a UI or something like that, you can actually push it through the module for active learning. So you can learn a lot faster given a uh, lot less examples, which the algorithm is not very confident about. Cool. Um, so sometimes you can do everything with machine learning. There are a lot of cases where you cannot use machine learning um, and you just have to, the easiest way might be to actually uh, just write a set of rules and person name matching is one uh, sort of task we have encountered again and again where you to just say, hey, you know what, let's just use a pre-created dictionary. So someone out there has created a very nice um, dictionary of nicknames, diminutive names, etc., for the Western, for Western names. So it's quite comprehensive. So this is something that you have to use. There are other situations where um, you have names that are spelled in very different ways. And then you have to find some implementation of SoundX or today they use like double metaphone is a very common algorithm. So we use uh, the, these kinds of techniques to, um, 
to transform these into phonetic representations, which will actually match. So this is a common thing that we've had to use. Here's a very nice, uh, nice table that someone has created. This user has created of most uh, popularly used um, record linkage software. Look at all the uh, sort of columns. Do they have APIs? Are there GUIs? Some of them have GUIs so that they can be used in a more efficient way. Um, linking, deduplication, supervised learning, so all these nice features. Cool. So next, let's come to unstructured data sources. Uh, so most of the world's information is, I think, um, present in the form of unstructured text, uh, unstructured information like text, news articles, reports, emails, etc. And uh, it's a pretty hard task to parse out information, do information extraction over uh, this text, and uh, and turn them into knowledge graphs. In this space, um, I've really been uh, quite pleased with an open source package called Spacey, which is an NLP software. Um, unlike NLTK, NLTK, uh, I think a lot of people have used NLTK. It's more for research purposes, gives you a lot of different options for putting in like 10 different types of taggers, tokenizers. It's a very good, a package for experimentation and learning, but Spacey has been optimized for um, like building actual real world software. So it has a lot of pre-built models for part of speech, NER, noun chunking. You can even create your own custom NER from, let's say you have a biomedical application or legal application where you have different kinds of entities like a molecule name or something like that. And or the syntax of the English is different, then you can build your own NER software, right? NER model right from scratch, or you can improve custom the existing NERs. And they have a very good uh, tool, a UI tool called Prodigy, that you can build all these models really fast. So imagine you have, you can employ a few, few users who can use this Prodigy UI you can go through a few thousand examples really fast. And I think there's an active learning component built too. So if, if um, so it, this thing builds, this prodigy will behind the scenes build the model as you are labeling examples. And then it selects examples where, and prioritizes examples where the classifier is unsure. Um, so this is a very good um, software for doing that. It also includes an entity linking framework. So we learned about entity linking in lecture, so I won't go through them, go to that. But Spacey also includes the entity linking framework. It's a framework, it does not actually link to a database, but someone out there, uh, it's called Spacey Entity Linker. They have created a, a linker that maps to Wikidata. So it's pre-built on Wikidata, so you can uh, use it quite, uh, it's almost ready to get used. Cool, so that is about um, how to in extract information from text. Oh, there's one more nice thing that Spacey offers is dependency parsing. Um, so look at this sentence here. So if you want to learn more about dependency parsing, go take CS224S, Chris Manning's, uh, or Percy Liang's course, um, and it'll tell you all, all about dependency parsing. But essentially, it creates this kind of, there's a graph structure right here. Look at this sentence, John married Jill in 1998. And you, just like a graph, it has edges, directed edges, they're labeled according to English grammar. Um, and you can use all these signals to actually build and train a graph. In fact, if you look out there, you will get a lot of implementations for subject, predic predicate, object, the triple extraction using spacey dependency parsing. So, okay, cool. So someone out there has created a very good package called SpiceX, which is spacey pipes for knowledge extraction. And it is a whole end-to-end um, -end pipeline to go through, go from unstructured text all the way to building a 
graph called a wiki graph that's their reference application and they have included all these different components so it's very new so i encourage you to take a look at it now let's come to so let's come to graph databases so imagine you do all this work and massage and extract and process your lists and then you augment all those uh, that information with knowledge extracted from um from um from unstructured text and now you have a knowledge graph representation now you have to actually store the uh, store all this information in a what is called a graph database so graph database is very similar to uh, sql databases are used for more online transaction processing than analytical processing uh, and i will kind of i will cover the analytical processing in the next section which is graph compute engines so when choosing a graph database there are lots of different uh, dimensions in which you can uh, evaluate them whether what do they have a di distributed implementation is that acid what are the query languages that it supports unlike sql there is no good standardization yet in the graph world um recently cipher has been taking a little bit of lead but still i think like sql there is no clear winner or clear standard then for real world projects there's a lot of other dimension is it managed what is the pricing what is the support ecosystem are there plugins available are there developers available to to work on your project support your project so a lot of different dimensions and then uh, i will go through two of them actually one is neo4j so neo4j actually offers um, yeah so neo4j is the most popular one that i've seen and they have two versions one is called a community version which is open source and then they have an enterprise version and i won't go through too much depth if you look at last year uh last year's course you will actually find a very nice video by someone from neo4j so it's a property graph it scales horizontally it has a lot of access controls uh you can i think there are node level and edge level access controls so you can label these nodes and then give access controls that some people some users may not be able to see all the nodes uh i think they're the ones who are the primary drivers of cipher they have good support for drivers uh connecting programmatically through different programming languages they have a ui that comes over with it if you go to the professional version then you have a lot of options for managed failover backups all this but uh, i won't go into too much depth uh, there's i've given the link here so you can read more about it cool so next is since the cloud is so popular i thought i'll just mention a few lines about amazon neptune it is not open source but if anyone here a student here or anyone is planning to i know stanford creates stanford students are like uh, one of the best entrepreneurs and you might have an idea in mind and if you do and they need knowledge graphs or graph dbs i think amazon neptune is a good option to start off with it's a relatively new offering it is managed it has both property graph and rdfs um it supports the gremlin and sparkle um interfaces query interfaces it is acid this continues back up to amazon s3 um if you have a if your product is as users across different parts of the globe there is automatic replication between different zones if you have if you're dealing with sensitive data it has encryption at rest encryption in motion um if you're in a in an industry like finance or regulated industry like finance or healthcare there's automatic auditing from the logs that you can generate pretty good logs and then um it those logs have a lot of information uh that you can use for auditing in fact they take a step even um 
they, they take the next step and have them, they have designed three common use cases based on uh, graph databases. So identity for identity um, and personalization, fraud detection and knowledge graphs. So they have defined three products that have been built over the Amazon Neptune. So if one of them actually, if you can map your uh, backend to one of these, then that's awesome. You can start using them and the pricing, pricing is quite competitive. It might be the best and the most fastest way for you to launch something with lowest cost. Cool. Um, so that was a section on graph databases. I'm doing a quick time check. Okay. So I'll go for around 10 or 20 minutes, more minutes. So graph computation, uh, compute engines are slightly different from graph databases. They are mostly used for um, doing heavy computations on graphs. So let's say you have your graph. Now you want to do like a very massive computation on it, like a page rank or a community analysis, community de detection. So there's a separate class of software that fall into graph, this category, graph compute engines. Some like Neo4j, like if you look at Neo4j, they have a lot of features that actually put them into this category, graph compute engines, but typically they are different. So let me go through two of them that are, um, that are quite well designed. One is like a very raw package called Network X. It's a Python package and very, um, very active package. Um, lots of contributors, stars, forks. It's all in memory. So you have to build a graph programmatically. Here's a small snippet of code that uh, you see. Um, and you have to literally write Python. If you're a good Python developer, you should go for this. Um, it's in, in, in memory, it has a Python interface. It does not have a query language, et cetera, to, to query the graph, but some, if there are some other packages available which have created like a query language for that. And if you're a Python expert, it's very flexible. You can actually, if your nodes, if your classes, Python classes hashable, et cetera, you can actually embed any kind of object into a node and an edge. It is rich, very, very rich in algorithms. So I'm gonna actually click here to just show how many algorithms it has. Look at all the, all the, all the available algorithms that it has. Um, it's just amazing, very impressive actually. Um, community detection, page rank analysis. Um, so all sorts of things. So definitely use, use this package uh, if if you want a plain, very simple um, Python-based package. Uh, so next, okay, so here's a very good, let me see, yeah. So here's a very good demo that someone has created uh, based on Network X and done community detection over. Um, so this is a novel that you all know, Les Miserables, and then, um, I think it's written by Victor Hugo. And then there's a, these are all characters in, in, the, uh, in the novel. And then someone has actually created a co-occurrence matrix of characters that, that are mentioned in the same chapter. And then they've ran a community detection algorithm. And um, they are the, the colors represent those. And someone has created a really nice vis uh, animation using a package called D3. And I'm mentioning D3 because it's again created by, it's a JavaScript visualization software created by a Stanford grad. Uh, so let me just, this is the raw covariance matrix. And then using D3, D3 has this visualization. I don't, I don't know if you can see all the nice animation, but uh, you could actually do community detection and make this kind of a visualization. Yeah, clear. so we can we could see the animation, but what is this animation actually showing? So it is showing the following uh, from covariance matrix. It actually tries to guess based on which characters might all know each other and might be one community, and it colors them accordingly. And then this whole whole fancy animation is a very nice way to reorder the rows and columns 
so that all these um, communities they are uh, they appear together in this visualization. Was that clear? Yeah, I, okay. I think that, that that's clear. It cool. sounds interesting. So, do you know if uh, people have validated this? And um... good question. I do not know actually. I do not know how people if people have validated or all these sort of this group here, which is a community actually know each other. I don't, good question. I do not know that. But here they run uh, Louvain, the Louvain community detection algorithm to create these communities and sort of guess that these people might know each other. But that's a very good question actually. We need someone to actually validate this. Cool. Um, okay, so network access is great if you know Python really well your data set fits in one machine. What do you do if your data set is larger? What if you do if your knowledge graph is larger? Then I think you have a problem. It is very expensive to scale vertically. It's hard to buy machines with greater and greater RAM. Um, and horizontals, you have to resort to horizontal scaling. So what do you do then? Um, Apache Spark, which is one of the most popular um, parallel compute engines, parallel analytical engines, distributed analytical engines. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the next step from Hadoop. So the predecessor was uh, Hadoop and now people use Apache Spark and Sanford has a good connection to Apache Spark. Uh, Mate Zaharia is one of the creators of Apache Spark. Um, so you could use Apache Spark. Apache Spark has many different modules, one for machine learning, one for just database kind of operations. They have a module called graphics, which is very suited for creating graph applications. And um, there are, there, I found a couple of very good tutorials on the Stanford site that point you to Apache, uh, Apache, Apache Spark the whole Apache Spark and specifically the graphics module. So it in here, the in Apache Spark, the main object or class is called the graph class, which extends their main um, class called an RDD, a resilient distributed database, which is their implementation of a distributed list. And there are lots of operators that they have defined on, on, on a graph. Their property operators, structural operators. Let's say you want you want to reverse your whole graph. You want to create a reverse page rank. So rather than reading your whole million node graph and then copying and creating one, there are very efficient parallel implementations of um, just going and reversing the edges in the graph and then recomp so that you can create you can calculate page rank reverse page rank very efficiently. There are all these neighborhood, op neighborhood operators. Imagine you have a Facebook graph and you want to quickly say, what is the average number of neighbors each user has? So you can use these operators. And the whole, um, I think the whole effort that Apache Spark graphics guys have spent is in parallel uh, implementations, very efficient implementations. On the ML side, they do not have too many algorithms. They just have page rank and a personalized page rank. In all these space of discrete algorithms, they just have two or three. So not at all as rich as network X, but if your graph is large, then I think you are probably stuck with something like Apache Spark. And for the students here, if you're looking for a project to contribute to, open source project to contribute to, you might uh, actually try to join this project and enrich uh, their, their graph ML or, or, this, or just their graph algorithm package. Cool. Um, so what's next on the list of so done, done with Apache Spark? Cool. Um, so I think that's it. So I let me actually recap what I, I took you through a lot of information. So I just told you about how our software is architected today and how you look to the open source community in a very clever way to figure out how to map components. 
and show you some software on how to join lists, fuzzy joining of lists. Uh, then I talk, and there I talked about dedupe, which is a very customizable package in Python. Then I talked about spacey, which allows you to extract information from unstructured text, all the NER, the linking, how to build your own models using space, spacey's um, UI called spacey prodigy. Then I talked a little bit about graph databases. Uh, and there I talked about Neo4j uh, community, which is open source. And then I talked about um, I talked about a cloud managed um, product, Amazon Neptune. And then I uh, talked about graph compute engines. Where let's say you have a graph and you want to do this heavy analytical uh, workload on it. Um, so Apache Spark and Network X. This was a whirlwind tour of uh, the most typically what the steps you will go through when you are creating a knowledge graph. Uh, so with that, I think I'm done with my talk. Uh, Vinay, over to you. There are a couple of questions. Uh, we can just start uh, these two questions from Anand. Uh, how do we match the relationship between companies? For example, Cyrus Logic is a supplier of Apple. Shall we use Dedupe or Spacey or entity linking or Wikidata or? So you need some source to say that Cyrus Logic is a supplier of Apple. You need to look at news uh, sometimes for important suppliers. Uh, Apple will mention that in their uh, filings in their uh, financial SEC 10K or 8K, or Cirrus Logic might. If Cirrus Logic wants to, most of the time the smaller company mentions this larger company. So you have to actually look at these uh, sources for, um, for this piece of information. There are a lot of vendors like FactSet who actually curate. They have a bunch of people who look at all these documents and they sell all this information. So you can, if, if you're using it for work or you can spend that amount of money, then you can even buy this information from vendors or else, or else you have to just look at news, run Spacey on it, uh, run entity linking on it, um, run relationship extraction, et cetera, and create this on your own. Right. So it's, uh, it seems that uh, identifying whether somebody's a supplier or somebody else, that's not really a linking problem or it's more of a sort of relationship extraction problem. Yes, it's a relationship extraction problem. And then to strengthen the edge, to be really confident because, uh, because the web does not contain curated information, then you have to look at lots of documents. And there is, if there is strong evidence in multiple documents that Cirrus Logic is a supplier to Apple, then I think you can, you can say, okay, I will curate this node. And when you look at multiple documents there, I think you might need to use dedupe or, or the string matching functionality of dedupe. You might need to use entity linking, et cetera. Okay. And does Spacey provide you with a relation extraction library? No, so they, they provide you um, the building blocks that you can use to extract relationships. So they provide, uh, first of all, NER, noun chunking. And then they provide you the dependency graph. So you can walk the dependency graph and then you can establish your own, conclude your own relationships. And Okay. So, so okay. So I mean, Spacey doesn't have a turnkey solution for relationship extraction. Is there another package that has that? Uh, so I've seen, for example, there are some packages that do SVO, the subject um, predicate and object extraction. Um, there are some, I've seen packages that do some kind of relationship extraction, but in my experience, none of them has been too good. So you have to actually train something on your data set. Okay. Uh, simple challenges are the following. Let's say you train one on news articles, the body of the news article. But when you actually run it on another a, a data set that is slightly has a different syntax, even if you run it, run one that has been built on the news article body, and then you run it on the news article headline, it fails quite miserably because 
the grammar and syntax of um, the news headline is different. So most probably you will have to train, you take the software and train your own extractor. That is well where I think the value lies. Okay, um, then there's this question, can we use AWS, Neptune, NetworkX, GraphX together? Is there a turnkey template for the end-to-end -end machinery to launch a KG-based system? Uh, yes, so they're all programming. Uh, so NetworkX is used, can be used programmatically. GraphX can be used. The, the simple answer is yes. Uh, you can easily tie all these things together. Network X and graphics are easy to package and work to and to join and uh, uh, and connect to each other because they're both um, uh, programming packages. AWS Neptune is a is a package that that offers REST APIs and other kind of APIs that your other two programs can can actually communicate with. So you can actually uh, actually create a system, a composite system that has all the three together. Okay. Okay, uh, is uh, anyone aware of general KG tool that one can use for vetting vendors? For example, sizing, licenses, type of pricing, et cetera. Hmm. That is, I have not come across uh, Come across this, you would actually look look at all these. There's no formula or any form or anything that I've seen out there. It's all on a you know really evaluate it for your own use case. Yeah, I mean again, I think at the risk of pushing my own ideas here. <laughs> I mean, if you're if you're going to vet vendors, you're probably going to specify some kind of rule-based knowledge that you will use to vet them, right? Again, I'm not sure if you this problem is more appropriate for machine learning because um, you probably don't want to vet vendors based on what you did in the past, right? You want to make a conscious decision as to why this vendor is good for you. And that's the kind of knowledge you would want to explicitly code in your program, right? And we've talked about examples of this uh, throughout the course uh, when we were talking about um, um, you know, the knowledge graph inference, we had this conflict of interest example, right? So where you're checking conflict of interest and you write rules to say what conflict of interest is, right? So to me, it seems like a problem which has a rule-based component to it. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool, so, okay. Do you want me to read the questions? Or yeah, I can, read, give it. Your... I can okay. read it. Anjan yeah. is saying, well, where can we read about the modern way of building software using open source components? All over the place. It's So I'll tell you how I personally try to catch up. And then maybe uh, Vinay, you and, Vinay, you and Mike can also give your ideas about how you personally catch up on all these new softwares. Software. Uh, so subscribing to a lot of newsletters, looking in technology news, uh, Git, looking at GitHub all the time. They have a feature called trending. Um, you can sort by stars. They have every week, they have, a, um, they have a module there which tells you all the trending software in the last week. Um, on LinkedIn, there's a, there's a guy called Philip Vole who curates and announce and and in his news in his link linkedin feed he puts mentions all these uh, awesome software so i follow him so there are i think all these different ways um maybe finna you and mike can suggest a few ways well my suggestion is keep coming to the knowledge graph seminar <laughs> <laughs> uh no, I mean, I, I, I think you've answered the question really well. I don't have a better answer to add to that. Mike, how, what are your ways? Uh, what have- I'm more, you know, since I'm um, more, perhaps more in the research community, I'm mostly concerned with reading the literature and trying to figure out what new ideas to incorporate and, and not tracking as nearly as, as extensively as you and Vinay are uh, the, 
the capabilities that are being put out in, in these various different repositories like GitHub. Uh, so I learned about them by, as Vinay says, by listening to you guys, to the various different speakers we've heard here. And, um, and I've got many mailing lists that um, seem to have found their way, messages seem to find their way into my mailbox. So uh, that's it. But uh, yeah, I don't have anything more to say than what, than what you guys have already said. Right. Okay. So then there's a question, are there any benchmarks for knowledge graphs? Um, so I've seen a couple of them for compute. I've seen a lot of different packages comparing uh, their numbers on calculating page rank, for example, which is like a computation over the graph. Uh, but for building graphs, I'm sure there are like maybe something around Wiki, Wikipedia or something. Uh, but I've not, I've, yeah, nothing comes to my mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they are mostly task specific uh, benchmarks, right? So if you're doing entity linking, then there is a benchmark for that. If you're doing relation extraction and within relation extraction, there are many different variations of what kind of relation you're extracting. And each of them has its own data set, its own benchmark. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Then if you are just interested in the raw performance of, uh, um, of doing inferencing on, on knowledge graphs, that would require different kinds of benchmarks, right? So it's, it's a whole space. And we are, I haven't done a survey of that, those, right? I don't know who else has. Yeah, good, good question. I don't, I don't know. What's the most frustrating, annoying, time-consuming aspect of building a knowledge graph? Any stories from your experience? I think the first part where you have to, you have to join these lists and then you have to extract information from these unstructured text, that takes a really long time. And it is not at all hundred percent accurate. So that is a guarantee that it is. It is you are hundred. You can be hundred percent accurate that you will not be accurate. So what do you do then? How do you how do you get the feedback loop in? How do you uh, get your users to correct for that? How do you implicit get explicit feedback? Implicit feedback. The qual so. I think there are all sorts of challenges when building knowledge graphs. So this is um, what I've encountered. How about uh, both of you? Yeah, I mean, I agree that um, it's a it's a noisy process, right? It's a noisy process, and um, you have to deal with scale, and it can be frustrating, right? To ensure that you are getting the accuracy you desire. And people tend to claim that everything can be done automatically, but in practice, it is not possible to do that. And for me, that's the most frustrating part where people advertise their solution as fully automatic, whereas it actually is not. I mean, you still have to do lots of manual work and they don't tell you about that. Yeah, I agree. What about, personally for me, one thing has been like learning these different query languages for graphs like SQL is quite intuitive, et cetera, but these query languages that I've encountered for graphs have been a little bit challenging to learn and a little bit non-intuitive. What are your impressions on that? Well, I, I think from whatever little I know of Cipher, it's not bad. I think Cipher and Sparkle, they are both pretty good, I think. I mean, they are, they are triple-based languages and uh, I think they have a nice formal translation to SQL if, if you want. So for me personally, query language has not been the challenge for, for graph systems. I, okay. Maybe because I have reasonable theoretical grounding in how the languages are put together, but um, yeah. Okay. Can you all please share insights on a good process end-to-end -end involving automation and manual curation for launching a new KG-based system? I mean, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's also a very broad question, right? I'm not sure if there's a formula on, on how you do it, right? It, yeah. A lot depends on what data you have, what problem you're trying to solve, how much resources you have at your disposal. I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's a 
cookie cutter solution to this question. Yes, I agree. And then, yeah, it's it's very messy. And the things that we covered in, in the lecture a few minutes ago, and then how to get the users involved and keep your graph fresh, etc. Mm -hmm. so no, no easy formula. Okay, so then there's a question, can people use GraphDB for graph computing? Um, GraphDB is OLTP, graph computing is OLAP. Can you use one for the other? And I think Naren's slide explained this very clearly. And I think what I got from Naren's slide was that if you are interested in things like asset properties, you want to do transactions, right? Then you want a graph database because you will be changing your database, right? And and you can't, it's not a pure read-only operation, right? Whereas OLAP or analytics, they are primarily read-only operations. You're not making updates, right? So clearly, if you wanted to do updates, you shouldn't be using OLAP, right? And if you're using OLAP, if you only have reads, potentially you can do optimizations, which you won't be able to do if you have to do both reads and writes. Right. So um, clearly you can use an OLTP system for OLAP. Most likely it won't be as fast because you are having to optimize both reads and writes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I have a comment on that. There's a uh, embedded in this comment is a sentence which says, it seems graph DBs does not, do not have much use. So let's say you want to do just traversal traversal of links or something like that. You can quite easily implement it in a SQL database, but then you have to index some of those columns and then match and actually you, you have to do the traversal yourself. In If you look within how a graph DB is designed, uh, right in the node, there are the C-like pointers to the next node. So all that traversal becomes super fast. So in applications where you have to really traverse these nodes really fast, there I graph DBs are very, very useful. Yeah, yeah, I think we covered this in our lecture too, where I compared uh, uh, it on a very simple example, what it would look like if you were modeling it using graphs versus modeling it using SQL, right? And the SQL queries turned out to be a little bit bigger or longer, right? As compared to the queries in graphs. And, and I also said that, well, you know, you could write a translator from graph queries into the relational queries. And in fact, uh, um, the system that relational.ai people are building is in their spirit, right? So I mean, their underlying storage is purely relational, right? But they still accept graph-like queries. Their language admits graph-like queries, so you can have compact queries. And they have implemented special join algorithms that do very well on the on the graph queries. Okay, so which question do we want to take? Let me actually. There are there are also lots of things in the chat. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Cool. So even I can read. So the chat was fairly empty. Oh, QA. No, it's it's in the QA QA box. Right. Um, okay. Any thoughts or tools that might help with incremental adoption of KGs rather than taking a big bang approach? Oh. So I would overall say if it's a simple application of knowledge graphs where you don't have to do too many operations, graph-like operations, just traversal or something like that, just use a SQL and implement all the traversal yourselves. You'll not be able to do a lot of things like then compute shortest path, do all the graph kind of analysis, subgraph, um, page rank, community, but it all depends on maybe you have a simple application that you want to create. Just yeah, use and I think the other way to say that is that if you have a problem where traditional solutions are failing, then look at a graph system. I don't think it makes sense to push a graph-based system just for the sake of pushing a graph-based system, right? <laughs> 
if if you're working with a relational system and it's working for whatever problems you have at hand, just keep using it, right? Yeah, use relational, use search engines, somehow find clever ways to use search engines. Um, if you can get by, just do that. Right. So there's one here, Vinay shared a great UI framework for the KG based systems for user experience. Are there good templates in D3? I don't know specifically for that, but D3 has a good, good set of um, visualizations which are interactive. Um, and you can just take a look. There's, there's a very good website by the author and the author has curated a large number of examples from different people that sent uh, sent their ideas. So you can actually go through and then you'll get a pretty good idea. So somebody's saying, what's a good uh, set of tools for a non-expert to use for building a knowledge graph? I mean, I, I'm not sure if, a non-expert can easily build a knowledge graph. No, that's why we have courses on this topic. Um, and, yeah. and again, you know, non-expert is a, it's a very broad field. You know, I mean, there are non-expert programmers and non-expert CS people versus English majors, right? So I don't know what kind of non-expert we are talking about here. Um, yeah, and it depends on the data sources. Let's say you have lists, you have five lists that you want to join together and create knowledge graph, some of the packages that I mentioned today to join lists, they have actually UI. They have a UI and then you can have the non-technical user actually uh, join those lists, etc. And once they're joined, I think, then you could, uh, you could load them up into a knowledge graph. Right. So drawing a schema is tedious. I have hundreds of tables. Is there a tool to draw schema from the data? Well, <laughs> I'm sure there is, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are uh, people out there who are, um, who, who are visualizing relational schemas. They are mapping it to some kind of an ER scheme or, um, right? So Brian, are you aware of any so no, I've seen all those ER diagrams, et cetera, of schemas, but learning that automatically from data, I, I do not know. Okay. Okay. So I propose that we conclude this segment. Okay. I think we've answered, taken most of the questions, uh, substantive questions. I, I need about 15 minutes to do my part. Yeah. Sounds good. And uh, that will take us to like 5.48 and um, 5.38, and then we still have 5, five for some minutes for question, uh, question and answers. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So let me get my slides. All right. So this is the last week. And uh, during this series, we started off by talking about what is a knowledge graph. We discussed the data models, the query languages. Then we had a few lectures on how we go about creating a knowledge graph. Uh, we had a segment on uh, how to reason with the knowledge graph, how to access the knowledge graph. We saw lots of different applications. Today, we've been talking about uh, implementation tools. And now we are at a point where uh, we want to conclude, and we also want to look a little bit uh, towards the future, which we will be doing mostly in Thursday's session. So in next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, try to uh, synthesize and try to address this question of how do knowledge graphs relate to AI? As I was saying earlier, um, I have seen a lot of people just give this knee-jerk reaction that uh, there's nothing new about knowledge graphs and knowledge graphs are being, have been done in AI for a very long time. So 
This is just old stuff rehashed. And my own view is that the fundamental theory is fundamental theory. It's not going to change. Uh, and that's why we define a knowledge graph as a directed label graph, which has been around for a long time, right? There's nothing new about that. But yet there is something new, right? And that's sort of what I'm going to try to convey in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And some of these thoughts uh, are uh, synthesized based on uh, various talks that uh, we had in the series last year. And, and they are also influenced by some of the things that have been said uh, in lectures uh, during this year's uh, series. And I've basically synthesized them into three main points, three big points. One is uh, knowledge graphs have become a test bed for AI. There is this new discipline, which we are now calling graph data science, which exists now, which did used to exist. And then there are some interesting uh, observations about how do knowledge graphs fit in the ultimate vision for AI, okay? And I'm going to go deeper into each of these three. Knowledge graphs have a two-way relationship with AI. And the way that works is, in a way, knowledge graphs enable many AI applications. That is by using knowledge graphs, AI applications perform better, they get better. And in the other directions, the AI algorithms, they can be used to create knowledge graphs. AI is helping us build knowledge graphs. Let's look at each of these sides of the relationship a little bit more closely. So the personal assistants like um, Alexa and Siri and Google Now, they all use knowledge graphs. And it's sort of well accepted that if these assistants can use knowledge graphs, they can get more things done. We also saw that uh, knowledge graphs are playing a central role in recommendation systems. We have heard about the Amazon product knowledge graph, and we've seen that how it is used in their uh, commerce website, and 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 we see its effect. You know, it's able to suggest with some degree of accuracy as to other things we should be interested in. We also heard from uh, Shashi early on. Um, uh, in the series when he talked about how knowledge graphs are used for uh, improving the search results. And in fact, in my first lecture, I had talked about how uh, a graph like Wikidata can be improved, can, can be used to improve the search results. So these are all examples that knowledge graphs are enabling these uh, AI applications. It, they're enabling these AI applications to function better. And all of these applications I would claim, you know, they are novel. They, these applications definitely didn't exist 50 years ago, right? It's more of like a phenomenon that has come about in the last 10 years. In the other direction, the knowledge graphs that we are using, they are being built using AI algorithms. So for example, we talked about uh, schema, uh, schema mapping and entity linking, and especially for doing entity linking, we talked about active learning techniques. We were doing active learning of uh, random forests, which is an AI technique, but it is helping us build the knowledge graph by fusing the entities coming from different data sets. Entity and relation extraction from text, uh, they use NLP technology. And we considered the use of language models during the course for doing both entity and relationship extraction. Then uh, things like uh, data cleaning, anomaly detection, inference, question answering. These are operations on the knowledge graphs. So for example, the inference and question answering. Uh, to do question answering over knowledge graphs, we are using natural language processing algorithms. And in a way, those AI techniques are helping us make uh, better use of uh, these knowledge graphs. So that's sort of a two-way relationship that has kind of developed between uh, knowledge graphs and modern AI algorithms in a way that they are both feeding off each other. So that was my first point, okay? So the second point is uh, the emergence of this new field, which we are calling graph data science. And this is driven by uh, two different trends. 
One is uh, modern organizations have huge amount of data, be it search engines, e-commerce websites, banks, grocery stores. They, they are tracking lots and lots of data and the businesses are very interested in deriving knowledge from knowledge from the structure of the data for a variety of tasks, for recommending products, for doing marketing, for doing business intelligence, whatever. So the desire to make use of this data has spawned this field that we are calling uh, graph data science. And many components of graph data science, they are not new, okay? So things like graph algorithms, graph visualization, graph queries, these are topics that have been worked on for 30, 40, 50 years, or maybe even longer. But their confluence in the context of the availability of data has presented some new things. And first and foremost, uh, there is increasing use of machine learning for making uh, predictions, which has led to this uh, subspecialty called analytics. But these machine learning algorithms, they cannot work in vacuum. You need some knowledge about the domain to figure out what features should be in your model. And then you also have to understand how your model is responding to these features, right? So which is a fairly unique skill set, which in older, older times used to be possessed by knowledge engineers. But in the current uh, times, uh, you have to be able to do feature engineering and that requires some real skill, both in the domain, as well as in the understanding of the algorithm. And then there is a need for a new kind of data exploration. Uh, like when you are dealing with a very large amount of data and you want to present it to the user, there is a skill needed to design proper user experience for it so that the user doesn't get lost in it and they are able to uh, make effective use of it. And the confluence of uh, these three fields, analytics, feature engineering, and data exploration, this is what we are calling graph data science. And this kind of skill is um, in very high demand in the industry. Um, I know of a lot of uh, organizations who are hiring like crazy for uh, graph data scientists. And we anticipate that this skill is going to remain important and maybe become even more important in the future. So that was my second point. Now, uh, the third point is um, knowledge graphs for AI. And as I noted earlier, knowledge graphs have been used in AI since the beginning. The earliest knowledge graphs were uh, semantic networks. And then some people said, no, 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 we have to associate more semantics with the semantic, or we have to formalize the meaning of semantic networks. And that spawned this whole field of uh, description logics. Some people who cared more about the tractability of reasoning, they went in the space of uh, description logics. There are folks who focus exclusively on rule languages. They're not necessarily uh, concerned with uh, the decidability of reasoning, but both description logics and rules are a step up over semantic networks by adding rigorous logical semantics. We also have a need to uh, deal with uncertainty in the real world. And to deal with uncertainty, the earlier models in AI were simple base, base nets. But more recently, there has been a substantial development of base nets, uh, which are currently known as graphical, probabilistic graphical models. So all of these uh, representations, they have their roots in directed label graph representation, and they have been worked on for a long time, and they are fairly mature. But representation is only one side of the story. We also have to be able to build the representation. And for building the representation, the early approaches were based on a person sitting down and writing that piece of knowledge known as knowledge engineering. But there were also techniques to automatically learn symbolic knowledge called uh, inductive learning. And more recently, we have seen the uh, uh, heavier use and success of uh, machine learning methods. So that brings us to the question, <laughs> Uh, what has changed? Uh, what is new? And in my mind, the, there are three differences between the classical work on 
these topics versus what's happening now. And those three differences are scale, bottom of construction, and mixed modes of construction. So by scale, I mean that even if what we are building now are semantic networks, but these are really huge, right? We said that the Wikidata knowledge graph, even if you say it's just a semantic network, it has 80 million, 80, 80 million or so objects or 3 billion or so triples, right? We've never had a semantic network approaching nearly that much scale. So the scale is really different in terms of what we are seeing in the knowledge graphs of today. Uh, the second point is the bottom of construction. Uh, the early work in uh, AI was driven by this desire to do a top-down design. Let's sit down, let's carefully design what we are going to model, and then we are going to populate our model. But what we see happening these days is let's see what data we have. Okay, let's see what data we can collect. And then on that, we will run our machine learning or we will run our NLP and we'll see what kind of entities and relations we can extract. And once we extract them, then we'll figure out uh, what kind of conclusions or reasoning we can, we can draw from it. And I would say there is a lot more of this bottom-up kind of work going on these days than it used to be. I mean, not that in the uh, earlier days, there was no bottom of work, but currently there is preponderance of work is focused on doing bottom up uh, analysis or data driven analysis. And three, um, the knowledge graphs of the sort we are seeing today, they are being constructed using mixed modes of construction. Uh, I mean, there's clearly some manual effort or traditional knowledge engineering, but there is heavy use of automation. And that's what's helping us get to the scale, right? It's not just one strategy or one method to build the knowledge graph. We are using a combination of methods to build the knowledge graph. Having said that, these three are the big differences between knowledge graphs of today versus what was happening a few decades ago. It doesn't mean that we can't have AI at small scale. You know, there are a lot of problems which are small scale, but they still require intelligent behavior. It doesn't mean that top-down design is not important. Even if we build our uh, knowledge graph in a bottom-up manner, but we still have to think about the semantics of what we are learning, what conclusions we can draw from it. And that does require some top-down design. And the fact that some of the knowledge we can learn automatically doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to write down what we know, right? Anything we know and understand, we have to be able to express it in a computable uh, form. And the importance of that doesn't go away just because we are able to learn that knowledge. So in AI, you know, people have had this uh, vision of systems which have these um, visionary capabilities, like systems that have uh, complete models of a domain, systems that can formulate hypo hypotheses, perform high-level cognitive tasks, such as, such as designing experiments or providing explanations. There are, we, we're still not doing very well. We, we're not able to build systems like that. And it's unclear if knowledge graphs are really sufficient for uh, building systems like those. Knowledge graphs happen to be at a point where uh, they are able to provide us just the enough representation power which is needed for the uh, kind of applications we talked about, like search and data integration and NLP and vision. It, it's just at a point where it matches what's needed, but it is not clear that it is sufficient for where we eventually want to go. And that's really going to be our primary focus for next week, uh, not next week, uh, for Thursday. So on Thursday, we will have uh, two visionaries from our field, uh, Professor Jim Handler and Dr. Doug Lennett, who will uh, give us their perspectives on uh, where the future is with knowledge graphs and how knowledge graphs can help us go beyond the current state of the art and towards things that are not, not possible today. So with that, I will conclude uh, what I had to say. Uh, 
we can take a few more questions and comments, and then we'll end today's session. Cool. So there is one question. Okay. So great insight and guidance. Enjoying the studying very much. Mm, pausing and looking for the question. Oh, okay. okay. So that's just, just a just comment. A comment, comment from okay. Anand. So thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah, so then there is the question about um, personal knowledge management, and there are hardly any tools uh, available for that. Well, you know, I mean, I used to be involved in this uh, project called uh, Kalo, where at SRI, where we were, um, where our charter was to build a uh, system for personal knowledge management. And in fact, you know, our schema was a knowledge graph which had things like contacts, emails, documents, projects, and people. So we had five or so uh, different classes, and and you know, we built a we built a version of that, and and the system we had in the research project had a lot of interesting capability, only a fraction of which has been productized. Um, uh, but, you know, somebody saying, oh, they're still constrained by the hierarchical structure of folders. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that, you know, uh, somehow the state of the art in the products doesn't move very fast. Uh, and having been in that uh, research project, I know that the kinds of ideas we were pursuing in the research project, only 2% of that has actually made impact on the, on the products. Um, I, I don't really know <laughs> what to say, say to that, you know, I mean, um, Part of it is, is the extent to which um, the startups are able to pick up ideas from research and actually bring it to the market, right? Naren, Mike, do you have any, any perspective on this? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I think uh, you tie out a lot of ideas very quickly. And in especially in this space of AI, I think we're, of course, we're definitely very, very far away from having these products that <clears throat> are very intelligent and then will operate in any kind of circumstance. I think the trick is to figure out a very, very narrow use case. And also the whole product design has to come out really well. And that's, that takes all the effort. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the comment is that the end users are normal people, not scientists, and the tools you mentioned aren't useful for that, that use case. And I agree. I mean, I think this course is really designed for programmers, right? We had one session on uh, HCI and user interface design, but, uh, you know, I mean, that is a completely different uh, mindset and, and scale and completely different problem. So, so I think a lot of end users, not scientists or engineers, are likely to benefit from domain-specific special purpose knowledge management systems built by those scientists and engineers, and not general purpose uh, personal knowledge management tools. Even the Galo thing was uh, had specific classes of information that you were managing. And so it may not be that general purpose uh, personal knowledge management tools are, are in, in, a, in as great a demand as, um, as the commercial ones are. Yeah. Let's see, there's a couple more here. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, I mean, again, I think the, there, are, there is a ton of work on personal information management systems. I know Alon Halivi has had a lot of papers on the topic. Uh, I mean, he's the closest to the sort of the database type things that I'm familiar with. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there is in within HCI, there is there are a ton of people working on office automation and, and personal knowledge management tools. Well, is that what personal knowledge management is? Office tools? Is that, is that 
I'm not sure whether that was the only thing that was being covered there in that question. I agree with you about that particular subfield. Right. And that's an obviously an area where there may be some uh, commercial value. For... Right. It's a question about knowledge scientists here, and I suppose it's different from knowledge engineers, though I'm not quite sure I got the full gist of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the knowledge scientist concept was pushed by uh, Yuan Sigrida. He was one of our invited speakers last year. I think he was in lecture two. Yep. So, so, I mean, I encourage you to go listen to his arguments for knowledge scientists. But from what I recall, he was saying that when you are doing this schema mapping, it's not really possible to do it automatically. You have to know a lot about the domain. And that's the skill set he was calling as a knowledge scientist, where uh, it's not just crunching data, it's also being able to model the domain and, and understand the semantics of the domain and then being able to capture that. You don't agree, Mike, or? No, no, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of the odd man out in this whole knowledge graph world where, um, I think the the bar for what makes intelligence has has descended very low. If what we consider is Siri and Alexa and recommend their systems to be intelligent, I mean they're useful, no doubt, and I like them. But I'm not going to have myself be diagnosed necessarily by Alexa or Siri. I definitely would like to have medical research done by machine learning programs, or at least take advantage of that. But I still want to have a doc there for the time being. Or such what what makes intelligence has gone down. And my concern is not big data science, which produces very shallow and weak conclusions, but rather small data science. The Sherlock Holmes of the world that can take two little or three little facts and tell you who done it, using knowledge, large amounts of knowledge to, uh, to 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 form conclusions from very little amounts of data seems to me more in line of what AI used to be. Right. So yeah, so so I mean, I think I th that's exactly why I acknowledge that point of view in one of my slides. Right? Yes, I mean, right. just because you're doing big data doesn't mean that that's the only way to get intelligence. There is small data intelligence too, and that's that's equally important, right? Yeah, um, yeah. and also I think that there was this question, and and this is a discussion we've had amongst ourselves, is whether to even touch the overlap between knowledge graphs and AI. You know, I mean, in this course, we have covered certain body of algorithms and techniques, which have useful for certain classes of applications, right? And that is interesting in its own right, right? No, you don't agree? No, it's inevitable because machine learning right now is, is so uh, dominant and so uh, a, 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 producing is so productive at the moment, we have to talk about the relationship and knowledge with, with AI. AI equals machine learning. And of course, knowledge graphs are a key part of that as you just argued very, very eloquently. So I think we have to make that connection. The question is whether that is the AI of old or not. That's I think the, the schism that has um, arisen and has not really been resolved yet. But, but I think you spoke to that very well with your, with your slide to okay. the end. Yeah, I mean, I think that people will debate about that, right? And especially, if you present that view to people who grew up in the machine learning era, <laughs> they, they would probably say, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> right, so, so that challenge is definitely there. And, and I've actually experienced that firsthand, right? Yeah. And uh, because these days, if you talk to people about representation, it, what representation means is a vector. <laughs> that's what representation means. And that's the only representation people know about. All right, so we have roughly one minute. Um, any final remarks? Um, Looking forward to Thursday. Don't miss Thursday. Thursday is going to be good. Yeah, Thursday is going to be good. We have two luminaries. Uh, uh, Jim Handler, who is famous for speaking learned semantics, goes a long ways. And Dr. Doug Lennett, whose life has been about being at the maximal end of semantics. Right. So it should be a great conversation. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks to the speakers. Appreciate it. Thanks, Narayan. Uh, welcome. Bye. Okay, bye.